Um, this is a, a question that people wonder about a lot is the idea, um, you know, are humans still evolving and are we different than the rest of the creatures in nature and does natural selection um, still occur in humans? Does anybody have any ideas about that? Do you think people are still evolving now? Yes, no, maybe? No. No, people don't evolve anymore? Yeah, they're still evolving. Nope. Some people say yes, some people say, say no. I heard that your generation has some really weird stuff going on with your eyes. Does anybody know why that might be true? We were poisoning the water hole. We stare at a screen all day. Yes, I heard that, and so um, I, I wonder. I wonder really how true that is. But um, I heard that it has been very different. Um, can anybody think of anything else that you can think of from maybe even the recent past, maybe two hundred years ago or hundred years ago, that you think people maybe look different than they do now? Taller, obesity. Well, yeah, people, people are just way bigger, right? They're taller than they ever were before, generally on average. Uh, they're larger than they ever were before on average. Um, and if you don't think that's true, go to an old timey museum and like check out the clothing. Has anybody else ever done that? Like looked at the shoes and the clothes? I mean, I went to the Holocaust Museum and those shoes are kind of small. Yeah, they were small. I went to this uh, old museum in England. It was like an 18, about 1800s. And the ladies' shoe sizes were like tiny, like size three and four. And maybe a big one was like a four and a half. And, and even, the, even the guys, their clothes um, were way smaller, like, um, you know, considerably smaller. And so um, does anybody have an idea why people are getting bigger? Fast food. Well, that's, that, that accounts Nutrition. for that accounts for obesity, right? The, all the junk food, but um, the nutrition, you're right. The nutrition, the be with better nutrition, people um, just get to be bigger, right? They're just taller and they're bigger. And so um, you don't really have to go that far to see that natural selection is actually happening in people. There's a really good example of this if we look at milk. And so you guys, human babies, you know, are born to drink milk, um, they have this enzyme called lactase, and that is required to actually be able to digest um, the protein that's in milk, the lactose protein that's in milk. And as you get older and older, um, that lactase gene is supposed to turn off. In the past, it always had. But if we look back um, a few generations, um, there appeared to be a group of people that acquired a mutation and that allowed their lactase gene to st stay turned on. And so the people that had that mutation then, they could utilize milk and they could utilize dairy products for food. That's huge. When you can have, you know, a cow and every day go out and get some milk and then turn that into other food to eat. Um, that really increases um, your, your diet quite a bit. And so people who had that gene then, um, that mutation, they were just better um, nourished than everybody else. Um, those, that, that gene appears to have arisen from somewhere in Europe. And so a lot of Europeans first are the ones that were noted to be able to start drinking milk and using dairy products. And more and more of their children then survived because they were you know, healthier, they had more food to eat and um, individuals with that gene um, just did better. And so that's an easy example to show that yes, um, you know, natural selection is happening in people. And um, now it's sort of interesting. A lot of people your age, all of a sudden you can't really drink milk or you don't like to drink milk or dairy or you have some bad side effects if you drink milk or dairy. Is anybody in our class actually lactose intolerant? Like you know you can't drink milk? 
Does anybody get an upset stomach after they've had like maybe a big cheese pizza? Dude, not I can drink. Whole, not I the can. whole pizza, just some pizza, some cheese, yeah, with, uh, yeah. something with a lot of cheese in it. I can eat one sometimes. of those little baby bells and be done for the rest of the day. Like you don't, you don't feel well or you're full? It upsets my stomach and makes me like go to the bathroom all day. That's what happens when you're lactose intolerant. And so um, it, 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 it just happens to be that piece of cheese, but in different, different products work on people in different ways. Um, some people can drink milk all day long and it doesn't bother them at all. And other people can't have even like milk in their coffee. It really bothers them. So uh, lucky for us, um, there is a little tiny pill you can take. It's actually um, that, that lactase enzyme it's in a little pill. And just before you eat dairy, you're supposed to take that lactase. And then that lactase breaks down the protein that's in that milk. And then you don't get sick. So that's, that's available. It's really inexpensive too. I don't know. You can get it's like- $20 for stuff. a bottle of um, like 45, I think. Yeah, you can get a lot of them. And so then people that know that this is an issue for them, they just- you know, have that handy. And then if they happen to be um, out and they drink or eat something that has a lot of milk in it or dairy products, then they just take a pill. Um, you're supposed to take it right when you start to eat. But I think that's a really good example then where, you know, dairy is part of a lot of people's diet. You know, they, they have dairy, you know, morning, noon, and night. Well, two, three, 400 years ago, that would have not been the case. Only babies were able to actually get nourishment from milk and the rest of us as you got older um, as little kids grew up they, they couldn't drink milk anymore um, so let's talk about how do we get new organisms and so the process of getting new organisms is actually called speciation i believe this diagram is one uh, i know it's in your homework i think it's on one of your quiz questions too this is the idea, this is one of the ideas about how new species come to be. This is called allopatric speciation. And this is saying that there used to be a single population here, and then something happened where those two populations became isolated from each other. And then over time, they diverged from each other. You can see this this little fly or whatever it is, insect became yellow and this one became orange. That's because of the kind of food that they were eating, right? This one had yellow fruits and this one had red fruits. That's just a, a far, far-fetched example. Um, and over time that they became so different from each other that if you put them back together, they cannot interbreed. So they are now considered to be two different species from each other. And this geographical isolation can happen in a lot of varieties of ways, right? It could happen from, um, you know, something, you know, very dynamic like a volcanic eruption or a glacier or a flood or a mudslide or something like that. Um, it can also happen because of people. Um, can anybody think of anything that people could do that could separate organisms from each other so they couldn't get back and forth to breed or mate? Can anybody think of anything? Destroying their homes. Yeah. Building habitat. developments. Very good. Habitat destruction. So, you know, there's an intact forest in the first picture. Let's imagine that we go through that forest and put like a 16 lane super highway in it like they did in California. Well, that's exactly what happened in California. There are um, a handful of mountain lions that are sort of trapped near Hollywood. Um, every once in a while, one of them tries to go somewhere else, but normally it gets hit on the highway um, trying to navigate multiple expressways is really challenging for animals. And, and I'm sure all of you have seen animals hit on the roads too. So people, people can also do this. You know, we can geographically isolate organisms so that they can't find each other. Um, that whole process takes a while. So for instance, this says long-term isolation, right? So they're not going back and forth and they're not, there's no hybrids here that are half yellow and half orange. They, they, they are completely separate. 
So that's called allopatric speciation. Um, who studies this stuff? Who figures out what a species is and isn't? Um, those folks are called taxonomists. Um, I have a couple of friends who are taxonomists. Um, they are very detailed oriented. And so they are the ones who are responsible for naming and classifying um, what, what things belong to each other. Um, originally, this was really done by the looks, by their actual physical features. Sometimes it was done by, um, you know, uh, looking a little closer at maybe their breeding or their mating habits, but it was mostly more physical and behavioral. What do we do now to figure out who things are related to? Google it. Yeah, but how does Google know? Genes. Yeah, DNA, right? And so um, in the last maybe 10, 15 years, there has been some major reclassifications of organisms, things that we thought were related to other things because they look like them. But then when we actually analyzed their DNA, we found that they, they were completely different than that. They, they, didn't, they didn't look like that at all. They didn't match at all. So um, anyway, it's the taxonomists that do that kind of work. Um, how do we know about what used to live here in the past? Well, I think probably you guys have maybe even seen fossils and rocks. Um, fossils can be an imprint in the stone um, and lots of time you can have a whole whole organism that you can find. The fossil record is a worldwide record. It's not just what, what used to live here in Ohio or in China or somewhere else. The, when we know about the fossil record, all the scientists in the world share this information with each other. Um, based on the fossil record, um, they've done um, phylogenetic tree study. Well, a phylogenetic tree, you guys, is basically what I just showed you here, which kind of shows what's related to each other. And um, what, what the basic record shows that life has existed on the earth for about 3.5 billion years. We have fossils that are dating back that old. Um, life tends to um, evolve from very complex, or from simple structures to more complex structures. Um, original life or um, the oldest living organisms were kind of smaller organisms, now they're larger. But um, at the basis of all of this, th there, are, there is still natural selection happening with very simple um, and very, very small organisms like bacteria, yeast, insects, all of those things um, you know, can, are still undergoing natural selection as well. How do you guys know that bacteria evolves? Diseases? Yeah, we, like we like, try to cure them and it don't work. So, um, how many of you guys have taken an antibiotic? Why don't you guys all unmute? How many of you guys have taken an antibiotic at least <laughs> once in your yeah. life? Yep. Yes. Yep. Uh, yep. Yeah. Yep. Did any of you, you guys are about the right age, did any of you have like frequent ear infections when you were little? And yes. your parents used mm. to give you this pink stuff to drink that tasted like bubble gum? Yeah. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that's good. I got it for stomach aches. Yeah. So that's an antibiotic too. And so, um, if you all are pre parents now, you probably understand that you won't be giving that stuff to your kids because most ear infections are not caused by a bacteria. So um, giving you an antibiotic really didn't do anything. And so. Um, let's talk, there's, there's a lot of bacterial diseases out there, um, like MRSA that you might have heard of. Um, there's a, a, a antibiotic resistant um, tuberculosis disease that you might have heard of. There's, there's quite a few diseases that are becoming more and more antibiotic resistant. And the reason they are is because of our basically misuse of antibiotics. So in the past, people were kind of careless. You know, if you felt sick, you'd go to the doctor and you wanted to like leave with some pills. And so the doctors were pretty cavalier about 
just handing out some amoxicillin or ampicillin. And in some countries, it's just over the counter. Like in Mexico, you can just go to the drugstore and just buy it. Um, they have you know many, many, many different antibiotics right on the right on the shelves, and you don't have to have a prescription. You can just pick them up and, and use them. So when a lot of people are ill from a bacterial infection, um, I used to get bronchitis a lot, and it was a bacterial infection. And um, I was a student, and I, I didn't have a lot of money, so I would go and get the antibiotics, and generally I would start taking them, and um, after maybe three, four, five days, I would feel much, much better. And so I would stop taking them. And I would keep the rest of them for the next time I got sick. So let's talk about what I actually was doing to myself. So um, when you are sick from a bacterial infection, there are millions of bacteria that are attacking you at the same time inside your body. So when you take an antibiotic um, within the first two to three doses, you cut those millions down right away. Uh, a whole bunch of them are exceedingly susceptible to that antibiotic and they die almost instantly with the first, second, third dose. And so after just a very short time, just a couple, three days, you're gonna start to feel better because you killed off a whole bunch of those, you know, those bacteria. But if you don't take the entire course, then which kind of bacteria are left? What, was I, what did I keep doing to myself, you guys? Which bacteria were left after three or four days when I was like, oh, I don't need to take this pill anymore? What kind of bacteria were left? Stronger ones. And what do we call stronger bacteria? We say they're what? Antibiotic resistant. Yeah, we say they're resistant, right? So um, it, it could be that um, it might take, usually they want you to take antibiotics for about 10 days most of the time. Um, and that you are actually supposed to take them on schedule. That's another thing people often don't do. And that's because those bacteria are replicating every so many hours. So if you actually skip a dose, or forget, or you're a few hours late, you gave those bacteria time to multiply inside of you again. So the reason why we have these antibiotic resistant bacteria is really because people like me and other people too, uh, did, not, did not take their antibiotics properly, right? And so there are many, many antibiotic um, or bac resistant bacteria out there right now. And so instead of giving you something very safe like amoxicillin or ampicillin, they have to keep um, developing stronger and stronger antibiotics. And there are some bacterial infections that they can't cure. Um, like that flesh eating disease where you get a paper cut on your finger and the next day they're cutting off your hand and the next day they're cutting off your arm. Um, I'm not exaggerating about that. Some of those bacteria are just incredibly intense. So um, what's the moral to this story, you guys, about taking your antibiotics? Take them all. Take them all and take them as prescribed, right? Even if that means getting up in the middle of the night to take your pill on time, you should do that. A lot of people don't like to wake up to take the pill, but they, they should do that. Um, if everybody followed those instructions, then we would probably be able to stop some of these um, bacterial infections that are getting really, really strong out there. Uh, when you're a parent and your little kid is sick, do not, badger the doctor for a back uh, for an antibiotic right um you don't really want to give an antibiotic if it's not a bacterial infection a lot of these things that make us sick are viruses and taking um a bacteria an, an antibiotic does not fix a virus okay um all right so what about extinction so um there have been lots and lots of species that have gone extinct most species that once lived here they're gone now they've already gone extinct um species tend to last between one and ten million years and then for whatever reason they go extinct 
And biological diversity currently right now is being lost at a really fast rate. So here's a quick YouTube video. I don't think we'll watch it all. I'll, I'll just click on it and you guys can watch part of it. These are species that have recently gone extinct. There is a huge fundraising deadline coming up. Sorry for the ad, if that's what happens with YouTube. Right now, they're going to meet. 17 recently extinct animals. 17 going, going, gone. First discovered in 1966, the golden toad has the most distinct bright orange color. You would generally find them in Costa Rica in the tropical forests. They were very active in 1987 until very erratic weather hit and their pools dried up. Scientists believe there were around 30,000 toads and less than 30 survived. The last remaining frog was seen in 1989 and never ever spotted again. 16, extinction is forever. And it's soul destroying knowing that so many beautiful animals that used to exist are no longer around because of the destruction caused by humans. This one is a rare case where it was not the actions of humans, but rather an aviation malaria that caused the demise of the Hawaiian crow. It was 2002 that the last birds in the wild were ever recorded. 15, the blame game. There's a lot of finger pointing when it comes to the reasons behind why animals are going extinct. And amongst the stunning creatures to be believed to no longer exist is the Holdridge's toad. You used to be able to find so many of them in the rainforests of Costa Rica, but they were declared extinct in 2004. Some sites have now documented the toad on the critically endangered list, and the dwindling numbers are blamed on climate change and an amphibian disease. 14. Every picture tells a story. And what you're looking at is the Pyrenean ibex. Amazing story behind this animal is that it's the first animal to be brought back to life through cloning. Sadly, it only survived for seven minutes, but it's still phenomenal to consider. You would find these beauties in the mountains of Andorra, Spain, and France. And in 1981, there were only 30 in existence. In 2000, the last naturally born one died after a tree fell on top of her. 13. Miss me when I'm gone. This is the Allotra grebe, a bird also known as the Rusty grebe, and was officially declared extinct in 2010. Scientists weren't keen to declare it extinct because the area they usually come from in Madagascar is so remote that it was impossible to comb the entire area to find out. They were hopeful there were still some, but unfortunately the last sighting was in 1982. Habitat destruction is thought to be a factor in their demise, and and only one real photo exists of one of these grebes in the wild. 12. Count them while you can. The Spix's macaw is not entirely gone just yet, but you will have no chance of ever finding one in the wild. There are less than 50 in captivity, and the only reason why it hasn't been classed as extinct in the wild is because the area where they're from in Brazil has not been entirely surveyed. In 1987, the last three birds were captured for trade purposes, and one more bird was found in 1990. They tried to pair him with a female, but she sadly flew into a power line and was killed. Besides hunting, trapping, and destruction of their natural habitat, killer bees have also played a part in their passing. 11. Plenty of fish in the sea. You would think that, but when you hear of how many species are wiped out, it's very sad. This little Tacoba pupfish was common in the Mojave Desert in the U.S. and was first discovered in 1948. Most of these fish lived in the outflows of the North and South Tacoba Springs. Their numbers started dwindling when canals and bathhouses were introduced in the 40s. When the springs became more popular, trailer parks and hotels were built, which caused further destruction. 1981 was the last time one was ever seen. 10. Not for sale. It seems the fight against rhino poaching is getting more and more difficult. It won't be long before where we are showing our children images of all rhinos trying to explain these beautiful creatures. Already the rarest of the rhinos, the West African black rhinoceros, is officially extinct. You used to find hundreds of them in Africa, and now none, not even in captivity. Nine, when you're dead, you're dead. There's no coming back.
It was 2012 that the very last Pinta Island tortoise sadly passed away. This is totally blamed on humans and their hunting. Apparently, they were hunted for food during the 19th century, and when goats were introduced on the island in the 50s, the tortoise's natural habitat was ruined. People tried to conserve the tortoise, but their efforts failed, and they were left with just one. Lonesome George mated with others, but their eggs were never fertile. He died in 2012. Eight, forever in our memory. These Zanzibar leopards were found mostly in the Tanzania state of Australia. They were excellent predators and people were actually afraid of them. It was believed that witches would use the leopards to go and harass or harm the villagers, and the leopards became demonized. They were hunted intensely and by 1997 considered extinct. Seven. Okay. So I think that you guys get the idea, right? Um, one or two reasons, what did they keep talking about with a lot of those organisms that are dead, you guys? What, what are one or two that you remember over and over them saying? Extinct is with the human's fault. Habitat destruction, right? Um, you know, people, people doing things to their habitat or hurting them or killing them, eating them. So, um, you know, we, we have lost a lot of species in, in recent years. And um, some of the species are more extinct to going, um, to, uh, some of the species are more um, easily uh, vulnerable to going extinct than others. Um, if we have a really fast, rapid environmental change, then the species can adapt and uh, they, they, there's no time for natural selection to work. And um, so it could be, when you're talking about habitat destruction, it could be everything from you know, climate change, severe weather. I know they mentioned in Costa Rica with that golden toad that there was some drought years and there, there were no puddles then for their, for their eggs to be laid in. Um, having sea level rise, um, in the case of, uh, I guess, that tortoise towards the end there, they talked about how goats had been introduced to the island and then the goats basically ate, ate the food and ruined the habitat. Um, if the population's small to start with, there's not very many of them, then that might be um, a population that's at risk. Um, if the species is really specialized, maybe only eats one kind of food or only pollinates one kind of plant, uh, then that species is, is more vulnerable as well. Um, an endemic species, that's a new word for a lot of people, that word endemic. It means that it only exists in a certain specialized area. Anything that only lives in, in one kind of area, that's always going to be prone um, to extinction and a lot of times these very these endemic species that's a, a, a Hawaiian petrel uh, it's another native Hawaiian bird it actually nests on the ground so when people's cats are out and about or pigs are out and about that doesn't give um, that, that bird a very good habitat anymore um, these endemic species tend to have a pretty small population to start with um, so there is always some species going extinct um, that's called the background extinction rate. That's just, you know, normally happens pretty slow. We just lose one species at a time. But there have been several mass extinction events where at each one of these mass events, we've lost 50 to 90%, 95% of the species each time. That's a huge number of species to die off. Um, we can see this in the fossil record. There have been at least five of these in the Earth's history where there were a whole bunch of species and then they just disappeared. Um, about 250 million years ago, a whole bunch of species went extinct and we don't really know why that happened. Um, that's considered unknown. The best event that you all are thinking, and you're probably thinking about dinosaurs, um, that occurred about 65 million years ago. And the best guess for that was this, this giant asteroid that hit the Yucatan Peninsula and it caused all kinds of climate issues um, to rapidly take place. And that's the best guess for, for what happened to those dinosaurs. Um, 
we humans, us, are, we are in the process of the sixth mass extinction event. Here's a whole list of things that people do and, and have done, some of which you just saw in that video. Um, biodiversity, when we lose these species, uh, we need to keep organisms for their food, their fiber, their medicine, and all the ecosystem services like pollinators that they provide. And so biodiversity, biodiversity loss uh, directly affects humans. A lot of people think that it doesn't. It's like, oh, what difference of that little fish or that little crow, what difference does it make if that went extinct? Well, everything is interconnected. Um, I think it was... Um, Aldo Leopold, I think, who said about um, to, keep, to keep every cog and wheel is necessary to make sure that the ecosystem works, works properly like it's supposed to. Um, there's this new idea, and, and it, you heard a little tiny bit of it in that little YouTube clip. Um, there's this idea that we could bring extinct species back. Um, these are a few of the candidates um, that people are looking at, including the woolly mammoth. Has anybody seen that nature show on the, um, I think it's on the Discovery Channel, about hunting for woolly mammoth DNA? Has anybody watched that? You guys haven't seen that on I don't think so, no. So the idea is now through DNA that if we can, it's really just like Jurassic Park, everybody. Um, if we can find some of these extinct organisms DNA, we could insert that into a, um, a, a living relative. So for the case of the woolly mammoth, um, we could insert that into an African elephant and um, take her DNA out of the egg, put the woolly mammoth uh, DNA into the egg, and then that African elephant would give birth to a woolly mammoth. Technologically, we know how to do this. Um, the issue is finding viable DNA, DNA that's not dead, um, DNA that is still active enough to be able to do that with. And so um, there, there are, you know, lots of people doing this research, lots of shows, and there's a National Geographic magazine cover about it. Um, I, I wonder what, what do you guys think about that? Um, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so how can you bring back something that's already extinct? Like you can't, like how can you find that DNA? So in, in the case of the woolly mammoth, what they're doing is they're going to um, uh, like ice fields where the glaciers um, are starting to recede and they're looking for intact uh, woolly mammoth skeletons that are frozen and with the idea that um, probably some of the DNA in the bone tissue will still be alive, will still be functioning. I shouldn't say DNA. DNA is just a compound. It's not alive. But that there will be viable DNA. There will be cells that have been frozen um, that they could extract from that. And so that's what's on the Discovery Channel. These people running around trying to find half frozen or mostly frozen um, mammoths and then looking for tissue because their skin is still there, their hair is still there. Um, the whole animal in some cases is just frozen. So. Um, and um, also if they like, okay, let's say they, um, you know, find the DNA and they're trying to, you know, um, re-create uh, or like, you know, try, trying to bring them back. So wouldn't that like, you know, uh, mix the um, animal, like wouldn't it be like, you know, have whatever it was and half the new thing they're mixing it with? So what they, what they do is they um, take the egg from the living, fr from whatever organism is going to be the mom, they extract the DNA from that egg and then they insert the DNA from the other organism. So no, it would be the egg is going to be, um, you know, entirely that organism. And that's the idea about how they could bring these things back. Um, technologically, they, they can do this. I don't know if you guys know this, but 
you can have your dog or your cat or your pet horse, you can have them cloned. So the technology is available to clone animals now and people are actually that have too much money, they're actually paying to have their pets cloned. Um, but with these animals that are extinct, um, so here is some of my questions for you and, and I'd like you guys to think about it and unmute and let's have a conversation. Um, where will they live? What kind of life will they actually have? Um, would you pay money to go see these extinct species? Like would oh, you yeah. go to a Jurassic Park and pay? Um, and then this, this process, you guys, takes a lot of money and a lot of research. Is this a good use for those scientists' time and money to be doing this? Oh, no. And could, no. could these things impact current species? So let's unmute and let's talk about it. Um, first off, somebody t somebody take the first question. Where, the first are these, where are these organisms going to live and what kind of life are they going to have? If they were to, the way that I see it at least, is if they were to clone these species, they would have to get a whole lot of information about the time period that they're living in and what the environment was. So they would have to create an environment for them to live in. They wouldn't I, the way that the world has changed, I don't believe that a species from millions of years ago would be able to immediately adapt to uh, the conditions of the inv of the planet now. Right. They're, they're, the, the food that they eat and even the microbes that are supposed to be part of their stomach, maybe that won't even, they, maybe those microbes don't even exist anymore, right? And maybe Being the food is... Alone would affect them. What kind of life are they going to have? I'm, it would definitely be a captive life because, like, like I said, they would have had to create an environment and with, an, with something like that would be seen as an experiment. So they would want to find every last bit of data they could while they have this creature alive. So they would be pretty much just put them in a space that we made so we can study them before they die. And is that, is that a good kind of life for these animals, you guys? No. It, it's not it wouldn't be it, it wouldn't be something that typically you would want to put an animal through and so i mean that would raise the question of if the if all the animals are already dead then if we bring them back then it's we kind of we have to figure out something otherwise like there's no there's no way that we can just guarantee that we'll be able to put them in a situation where the animal will be able to 100 percent live or regular life if right. we, have, and how we don't many know of them are, how many are there going to be so a lot of these animals are yeah. you know they're they're in herds so let's say we find the dna for for one woolly mammoth and we clone it um then everything <laughs> else is going to be related to that woolly mammoth right if we can if we can make multiple copies of it um yeah. and you would, so, have, you would have to weigh like what the benefit is for the ecosystem, the environment, and for us as to whether it's worth all the time, money, and resources to bring them back to life. Would you pay to go to like a Jurassic Park? Yes. I mean, a Jurassic I, I would, Park, yes. Yeah, like dinosaurs? I, I would pay to see dinosaurs or woolly mammoths or saber-toothed tigers or something, but I mean, right if it's if it's some like orange frog, I'd probably be less interested. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. Y'all want to see a dinosaur, bro? I'm not trying to die. It would be really interesting. Jurassic Park, I'm not gonna. No, I'm good. Jurassic Park would be a terrible idea. If I get eaten by a dinosaur, I officially died the best out of anybody. That's that's fair. That's fair. Then I'll probably be like far away and watch it from like you know telescopes. I'm, I'm away until like I'm like, on my deathbed to go to Jurassic Park. Yep. Someone <laughs> feed me to the T-Rex. I'd rather watch a movie. <laughs> So uh, what about, could they impact our current species that are here? The ones that are already here? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. If we put them out in <laughs> the and, population. And if, if, if they manage well, to survive they're really in enough. The wild. But if let's you do like they think about T-Rex eating things. Let's, let's, let's pretend it's not a T-Rex eating something, all right? Let's, let's pretend it's a herbivore they bring back, like a, that tortoise. Um, or even the woolly mammoth is an herbivore as well. Um, so let's think that they're not going to eat current species. Um, could they still impact species? 
Yes, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, yeah, if, if we time. insert them into the environment, then by definition, they're an invasive species, so they'd probably disrupt a whole lot of things. Very good, very good, Adam. They're exactly right. If we all of a sudden bring back a species that has never been there before, the organisms that are there would be keeping with that if we were to turn it loose. And so, lastly, and then it would be nice to 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 let's have a vote on this. Is this a good use of scientists' time and money? No. I don't think so, no. No. Yes. Well, we rather, well, no. Be I think it differs. Climate change. I feel like some of the, like, the frogs and stuff could still survive and not like affect all that much. If there's yeah. some extinct species that had like an amazing ability to like fix nitrogen or somehow improve like take carbon from the air or something then i would say yes but yes, if, exactly. if, if they're gone and the world is still turning then i don't think we should devote a ton of money and resources toward it the reason that i said yes was because the way that i see it is if we can if we can get the get the technology and actually figure out how to bring back a species from the dead then if we're looking at it as a humanities point then that that could that could lead to literally all those stories that everyone talks about about eternal life. If we can bring back life, then there's a lot more we can do. Like imagine having like 50 Elon Musks. I'm sure we could do something. Oh God, we don't want that <laughs> too much. Hey, old Tesla. So One he is may not be able to, He may not be able to make a bulletproof window, but he did send something into space. Well, let's, let's mute again, you guys. Um, you guys had some very good ideas about this. And some of the things that you brought up, um, these are the same sort of ethical discussions that a lot of these scientists are having now. Um, they basically are saying that this idea of de-extinction is sort of a public relations idea to get people excited and interested about their research and maybe to find some funding for their labs. But what they're really interested in doing is trying to keep other extinct ex, uh, species that, that are maybe endangered from going extinct. So the same exact um, ideas of the, the research that they're doing about how to um, bring them back, that could be done with living things, right? So a uh, cloning to make more of one um, species so that, that there are enough of them, um, that'll give them an opportunity then to maybe come back over time. But this, this goes on and on. There's a lot of ethical things about it. Um, you know, even some people, a lot of people, I'm sure everybody in our class has probably visited a zoo at some time. Um, but a lot of people don't think zoos are very ethical. Um, you know, a lot of species don't do well in captivity. They really don't. Even if they're given all the food and special habitats and whatever, um, at the end of the day, they're not, they're not as, as well off or as healthy in captivity as they would be in the wild. And so um, I just wondered what you guys thought would think about the extinction and you guys had a lot of the same ideas that I did too. Um, so as far as studying um, ecology and, and the rest of this chapter really sort of is about ecology. Um, when you say that, and, and I'm an ecologist, I do restoration ecology. Um, I'm looking at the study of organisms and their environment. And so you can't really study the ecology of anything without studying um, evolution as well. They're kind of, they go hand in hand. Um, if we look at the biosphere, what is the biosphere? It's the, all the living things on earth and where they live. It's their habitats and all the living things. And what do ecologists study? We actually look at relationships and sometimes they're at higher levels than, um, than you would think. These are some of the levels of ecological study. I mentioned that because um, some of you might maybe even be as, uh, inspired to become an ecologist. Um, if you study organism, if you're an organismal ecologist, you're going to study a particular organism, like Jane Goodall studied chimpanzees, right? Um, if you study population ecology, then you're going to look at population changes 
Um, how many individuals of males and females are there? Are the populations increasing or decreasing? If you study community ecology, you're going to really look at the patterns of the species um, in that entire community. So we can see on the bottom picture, there's a coral reef there. Um, the, the same tea, sea, sea turtle is going by. Um, you know, it's interacting with those different kinds of fish and the coral. So that's really what community ecologists kind of look at. Um, if we look at ecosystem ecology, then they're studying everything that's living and non-living, and they're trying to look at patterns. Um, people who study ecosystem ecology often will look at shifting um, plant and animal populations within that ecosystem. They might look at changes in the environment as far as temperatures and precipitations within that area. If we look at landscape ecology, this is really looking at a larger area and trying to figure out why certain populations and communities live sort of where they live. How did they come to be there? Um, the fact that they're there, how does that actually change the landscape a little bit? And so that's what, what they're studying. Um, a habitat is the environment where an organism lives. Um, it includes all the living and the non-living elements that are there. Um, if we look at what is habitat selection, that's how do these organisms actually pick where to live. So for instance, if, if you were just dropped off in the middle of nowhere, um, how would you pick where to go, you know, spend the night or spend the week or spend the years, right? Um, there's a lot of criteria, right? You need food, you need shelter. Um, typically you need fresh water source nearby. Um, if you're an animal, you might be looking for a particular breeding site. Um, you know, particularly birds have very um, unique criteria sometimes for their breeding sites. And then are there, is there anybody else there? Is there, is there a mate or are you just all alone? So those are some of the criteria that organisms use to figure out where they're going to live. Um, and that is called habitat selection. How, how well that's picked really is going to influence um, the organism's survival. Um, lots of times juvenile organisms that are just uh, you know, driven out of a herd or dropped off somewhere and they don't have any experience they pick very they pick very bad sites um, and so lots of times they over time their survival is not good um, i i i watched um a, a webinar um last year about um birds uh songbirds like the ones that live in our backyards and uh we have an invasive shrub that it's in our backyards here in ohio called um Amur honeysuckle. It's a shrub and it's very pretty in the spring, has not lots of nice creamy white flowers all over it, but it only gets about 12, 15 feet tall. The branches tend to be kind of low to the ground and the, the stems are very arched. So it's really easy for predators to get up into the nests of these birds. And so they found that juvenile birds, it's their first year to make a nest, their first year to lay eggs, will often make nests in these honeysuckles. But because it is so easy for predators like snakes and raccoons and other birds to, to get up into those nests and eat their eggs and eat their babies, um, the juvenile birds that nest in these sites have very, very, very poor offspring survival. Like hardly any of their eggs actually hatch out and, and essentially become a bird. And so that is, you know, a, a bad choice for a breeding site. And um, unfortunately, that invasive shrub is really common in our area. Probably three-fourths of the forest and the understory is all that shrub. So the cardinals and the other birds will, will learn from that. And so then um, if they get another opportunity for breeding, they will pick a, a tree. They won't, they won't make another nest in that site. But sometimes organisms only have one shot, right? They, they're short-lived organisms. 
if they don't reproduce that first year or that first attempt, um, then they, they, they just die and they never get a second chance. So there's a lot of things that are in, interesting about habitat and site selection. Some of that has to do with disturbance too, right? How close it is to people. Um, a niche is that organism's role in the community, its actual function in the community. So here's a picture of that little Aki and it looks like it's picking something out of the bark. Um, if an organism has a very special role, special, they're considered to be a specialist, they have a specific niche in that role, in that, in that group. Um, a generalist is something that has a broad niche. It has many roles. So for examples for a generalist, um, I'm thinking of a bird called a starling, which is kind of a pest bird in our area. They'll pretty much eat anything. They'll nest anything. If you've ever had a nest um, in your gutters or in your house, it's probably been starlings. Think about where rats live, right? What do rats eat? They live everywhere. They eat everything. Um, coyotes are, are becoming frequently more common in Butler County in our area. And um, they're considered a generalist because they will eat and hunt and eat lots of things. So um, all of those things that are considered to be generalist tend to have pretty large populations. Um, they tend to be very resistant to extinction because they can just, if, if, if something that they used to eat goes extinct, they can just find something else to, to eat. And that's not so true with these specialists where they have a very special diet and a very special place to live. And um, they're, they're always on, on, you know, potentially be, going to become extinct. Um, as far as the population size of individuals um, at, at a given time, it can increase, it can decrease, or it can totally remain the same. Um, a good example of this is passenger pigeons. And um, they're an example of huge population decline. Um, one of that, the pictures I just showed you um, about de-extinction, it had the passenger pigeon. Um, the last live passenger pigeon was actually at the Cincinnati Zoo. Um, this was once one of the very most abundant birds in North America, and um, now they are extinct. And so that's a picture of 19th century hunting and um, of pigeons in, in Iowa. And let's watch this little um, video of, of looking at the passenger pigeons at the Smithsonian Museum. What can you see? There we go. Her name was Martha, by the way, the last passenger pigeon. Uh, let's see. Well, the Division of Birds. Thanks. The Smithsonian has one of the largest collections in the world, open to scientists from all over. Anyone who wants to come and study birds, they can either come here and work with us, or we can loan the specimens to them. One specimen stands out above the rest. Oh my God, you're kidding me. That's Martha? This is Martha. For a pigeon fan like Lucian, this is like seeing a movie star, the very last passenger pigeon. She died in Cincinnati Zoo yeah. at 1 p.m. on the 1st of September, 1914. She was literally alone for about four years before she died. And, and we knew at that time that there were no other ones in the wild. So this is one of the rare cases when you can actually place a, an exact time and date on an extinction. Today, Martha sits for posterity beside her companion, appropriately named George, a fellow passenger pigeon who died long before her. Hundreds of years ago, passenger pigeons were estimated to be about a quarter of the total bird population in the United States. A flock a mile wide, flying 60 miles an hour, can take days to pass overhead. So where did they go? The story really is not a simple one. There are, there are a lot of factors involved with any extinction. In this case, there was a lot of market. They were easy targets because they occurred in these large flocks of over a billion birds. Hunter could go and 
collect thousands at a time without, you know, really having to try that hard. Passenger pigeon became a staple of the American diet. By the end of the 1800s, millions were being shipped back to cities in the East. Another natural fact sealed their fate. They didn't lay as many eggs as other fish. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the biology of the passenger pigeon was such that they really relied on those large flocks for a couple of reasons. One was protection from predators, you know, there's safety in numbers, and they didn't have to lay a whole bunch of eggs to reproduce. So in a matter of just a few decades, we're just all gone. Once a species is gone, no amount of wishful thinking can bring it back. Birds still go extinct. But the loss of the passenger pigeon made people take notice. It prompted the very first legal protection for migratory birds. Okay, so now you know about passenger pigeons, which a lot of people don't know. Um, so they mentioned to you that these passenger pigeons occurred in these really big flocks with, with you know, thousands of members. Um, and so when you're in a very high density like that, um, it makes it easier to find a mate, but it also causes an increase in competition and vulnerability to predators. Um, in this case, the predators were people. Um, and it also increases disease transmission when you have high density. But if you're in um, a very low density situation where there's only a few individuals, then that might be very difficult to find a mate. Um, but the good thing about that is that all those individuals have more space and more, organi uh, more resources because they don't have to share. Large organisms usually have low densities. Um, they just need a whole lot more um, you know, area to be able to survive. And so they, they, just, they just need more resources. So this is a, a pretty cool um, idea here about spatial arrangement of organism. And this is called, these are called dispersion patterns or uh, populations distribution, the way that you would find them. And so um, there are three here. And no matter what we look at, whether it's trees or butterflies or anything else you can imagine in nature, every population will have one of these threes, we, these three patterns. So one, it's random. There is no pattern. The individuals are just, you know, haphazardly arranged here and there and everywhere. And the resources are really widespread. The second one, the populations, the organisms are very evenly spaced, and that's called uniform. Another name for that is regular, so that you could almost measure the distance between each one, and they would almost be the same spacing. That usually causes some, um, that's usually the result of uh, territori territoriality meaning that the organisms are competing with each other. And so they have just kind of divided up the land or the air or the tree into some spaces. Clumped is that groups of species are found um, in groups together um, according to their resources. So um, in this case, it's showing you a bunch of plants in an oasis and there happens to be water there. And so there's a bunch of plants grouped around that waterway. And so the organisms would concentrate in a particular area if, if their resources were there. So now I want you to think, and somebody who hasn't ever talked, somebody that like never unmutes, why don't you unmute and tell me which one of these three do you think is the most common? So if we were looking at whales or butterflies or anything else you could imagine, that that would be the, the distribution pattern. So now somebody who's never talked has to talk. Yay, go ahead, tell me, which one do you think is the most common? Third one? Go 
Go ahead. We can hear you. A third one. So you think clumped is the most common? And, yes. and, and I'll first off tell you, yes, you were 100% right. When I did this as a student, I said the first one was the most common. I was completely wrong. Um, why do you think that you are, well, you know you're right now, right? So why do you think, why did you say that? Because you're right. Uh, because there's a, uh, Honestly, I think that's the most common because I saw there's a deserts everywhere it's on the pictures. So it could be here in Ohio, it could be in the backyard here, and you would also find the same thing to be true. That organisms tend to clump together in groups. Um, and it's really resource dependent. So you are going to find organisms living near like nesting sites or near waterways or near a food source. And so that's where you're going to find them. And so that is the most common. So okay. somebody else, now you've got a 50% chance of being right. Good job. Um, somebody else who hasn't ever talked yet, because there's a bunch of you on here and I never hear from you. Um, which one do you think is the most rare that you hardly ever find it? Uniform. So I hear I have a person who says uniform. Does anybody think anything differently than that? Which one's the most rare? Random. I hear random. So who said random? Uh, I did. Noah. Okay. So Noah, you're right. Random is the most rare. We hardly ever find this where there's literally no pattern. The only place that anybody's ever been able to find a quote random distribution pattern is in the tropical rainforest. And that's simply because probably the area is so diverse that people weren't able to search at all. But that is pretty uncommon. Um, the second one, uniform, that is not all that uncommon. A lot of animals exhibit territoriality um, and there are even some plants that do that as well. They actually have a toxin in their roots and it keeps other plants from, from growing near there. So anyway, I think that's kind of neat. So no matter again, whether you're studying, you know, the sea turtles on a coral reef or you're studying the birds that live in your yard, you can, very quickly figure out their population distribution if you just see where they are. Um, and again, the, the clumped is the most common. Um, another thing that population ecologists are going to look at is the proportion of males to females, and that's just the sex ratio. Um, if the species is monogamous, like a lot of birds happen to be, um, then a one-to-one -one sex ratio will maximize population growth. So there will be one male for every one female. Um, age structure is basically looking at how old the organisms are. That tells you, are there a bunch of new ones that haven't started to have babies yet? Are there already, um, there hardly are any newborns and they're all a bunch of old ones that aren't capable of reproducing. So by looking at the age distribution and structure, we can kind of predict whether that population is getting larger or is it in decline. And species, um, you know, some species do continue to grow as they age, as they age like a tree. Um, some of the larger trees, the long-lived trees, they actually make way more seeds the older they get. Lots of the other ones don't. Um, and I already mentioned to you about birds. Um, a lot of the older individuals are better. Um, they've already made mistakes like putting nests in the wrong place or um, you know, not guarding their nest properly or whatever it might be, or not feeding their individual, their, their babies properly. So experience does, um, does help with, with making the individual better, better parents as well. Um, so people who study human populations, those are called demographers. 
And these are the four factors that affect human populations. Um, so natality is verse within the population and that's a positive, right? Because you're adding people. Mortality, that's pretty easy. Somebody died and so that's making the population smaller. Immigration is when individuals come in from outside the population, they're new to that area and that increases the population, gets bigger. And then emigration, and the reason I'm saying it that way is because it has an E in it. That means that some individuals have just decided to leave the population. They, they, maybe they've moved to a different country or, or they just left. And so um, natality and um, immigration increases um, populations and mortality and emigration decreases the, the population. Um, we're going to do um, a whole thing on human population growth, so I'm going to go by that pretty quick. Um, so if we're looking at population growth calculators, um, the natural rate of increase um, will basically be the birth rate minus the death rate. That's, that's how whether the, the population is increasing or decreasing. And so how fast it increases or decreases, we add in then the immigration and the immigration to that. And that's always reflected by a per thousand individuals per year. And so we can look at different populations and figure out whether they're getting larger or smaller. That growth rate is usually expressed as a percentage. And that allows us then to compare populations of different sizes. So, you know, we might have a population of 2 million people or 2 million organisms and a population of 500. But if we figure out their growth rate as a percent, we can, can, we can know right away whether that population is getting larger or it's getting smaller. So this curve is going to be something that you're gonna see for quite a few things. Um, this curve is called an exponential growth curve. Um, the population is increasing by a fixed percent. Um, people also call this a J-shaped curve. I suppose if I was really bad at drawing a letter J, it might look like the letter J. And so when we have these exponential growths, um, it usually happens in, happens in nature. If we had a small population to start with, there was not very many competitors and there were ideal perfect conditions. So that um, bird that you see there, that is not the passenger pigeon because she's extinct. It's a, it's a different kind of pigeon. But in this particular case, um, they followed that pigeon and you can see that the population just skyrocketed. Have you guys ever seen a graph so far in our class that looked like that? Population of humans? Yeah, the humans have an exponential growth curve right now. Exactly. So that's still considered to be a J-shaped curve. Now, these exponential growth rates hardly ever last. There are a lot of limiting factors that can slow down um, that reproduction and that growth. Um, it could be physical, chemical, biological, something in the environment that's going to limit it. And so now we're going to talk about something called the carrying capacity. And this is a very big biological concept. This is the idea that there is um, a maximum population size of a species that a specific environment can sustain. And so lots of times the carrying capacity is calculated, especially let's say, you know, out, out west where there's still wild horses. Um, they'll look at the um, amount, how much food is available. Um, they'll, they'll look at how much land mass is available. And then they'll calculate, okay, this, this area can support 2,000 horses or 100 of whatever. And so trying to calculate the carrying capacity is something that's done lots of times in conservation. So we know how many organisms we can have um, in that particular area. Um, another, I mentioned to you that those, um, that, that, that J curve rarely lasts. 
This is called the logistic growth curve. Um, some people say it looks like the letter S. I'm not really seeing a letter S there, but I suppose. Um, and the idea here is that those um, birds were having an exponential growth and they reached their carrying capacity. And then eventually um, the population stabilized at, at some number. I do really like this graph because it's showing you the limiting factors as sort of like a big weight. So those factors are pushing down that population. They're causing that population to not grow exponentially anymore. Um, there's a list of limiting factors that are pretty common. How many resources um, are, is, are the temperatures hospitable everywhere? Usually not. Um, are there predators or parasites or disease that are going to cause that population to, to get smaller? And so most species have something like this, a logistic growth curve. Most species do not have an exponential curve. Um, and so there's this idea about density and dependent and density independent factors. It's really kind of simple. Um, the idea here is that there are these limiting factors that are um, influencing when the population has a high density. So um, typically, if there's a high density, then you know there's increased risk uh, risk of predation and mates and disease. That would then turn and slow down the exponential growth, and we'd have a logistic growth curve. Um, the environmental resistance has a really strong effect on bigger, larger populations. Um, if it's considered to be a density independent factor. That means that um, it doesn't matter. The factor is not affected by density, how many there are. This would be something extreme happening like temperature, floods, fires, landslides, something major would come in. It doesn't matter how many organisms are in the way of a, of a wildfire, right? Um, a certain number of those are going to be, be burned up and killed because there's a wildfire or a flood or some extreme event. It didn't matter how many there were. And so that's why those factors are considered to be density independent. Um, in either case, these things are restraining population growth. They're, they're causing the population to stay smaller or to stay more stable. Um, caring capacities can change. Um, the environmental, you know, it, it, the environment's always changing. And so the caring capacity can change too. Humans could go in and do habitat construction or destruction. And likewise, humans could go in and replant prairies and habitats and, and make the habitat better. Um, people ourselves, people are always trying to figure out if there is a caring capacity for people. Um, and, you know, we have so far, you know, we have this exponential growth curve. Um, we keep increasing our caring capacity. Um, we have technology that's overcome a lot of limiting factors, like if you live somewhere where there's no you know, you, you have lots of seawater, but no fresh water. Okay, well, we have ways of desalinating the water and giving you fresh water. Think about all the really, really, really hot places people live and really, really cold places people live. Um, without technology, they probably wouldn't live there, right? They're probably not going to live in the middle of Saudi Arabia at 120 degrees if they don't have air conditioning or Maybe they will, but there won't be very many people there. So we have used a tremendous amount of resources to make our life better. Um, and so we continue to do that. So, um, uh, you know, here, you know, here by increasing these caring capacities for, for us, we have reduced carrying capacity for lots and lots of other species, right? We've taken their resources, we've taken their water, we've taken their food, we've taken their land. And so how might that affect um, our own long-term survival? If we keep 
reducing the carrying capacity for other organisms that are part of the ecosystem, how could that in affect us? And I have one last slide for today. Um, these are potential exam questions, which don't, I don't usually pop up onto um, a lecture and, and give you, but I wanted you to start thinking about this. I want you to think of some ways that we have actually um, improved our carrying capacity for our species. What are some things we've done? Um, can we continue to raise our carrying capacity? And if we can, how, how are we going to do that? Because remember, we're going to have like 10 billion people here by the time you're my age. So how, how is that going to work out? What are the biggest limiting factors for our population today? What are the things that are slowing down population growth besides coronavirus? Okay. Um, and overall, could the Earth's carrying capacity decrease? Um, we know what we have today, but what could we have tomorrow or next year or 10 years from now or 100 years from now? Um, do you think the Earth's carrying capacity is could be changed or can't be changed? So those are all, and I'm going to ask you at least one or two of those questions on your next exam. And so I, I really want you to think about it. I don't want you to try to Google an answer. I want you to think about our lecture today and what you've learned and what you think, and then write out your own ideas, okay? So that's all we have time for. Um, there's only a little bit of this lecture left. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to record the rest of this lecture and put it on a YouTube video and I'll upload that to, to our class. And then you can watch the rest of this lecture. Um, Monday, we don't have class. Um, and so I do want to try to keep us on schedule. So you need to finish chapter three um, this week or by Monday. And then I'll probably open the quiz up for chapter three on Monday, and then it'll be due on Wednesday. I think it's, I, I think it's good for us if we kind of keep the same schedule. So does anybody have any questions about anything? Yes, no. No, nope, I'm good. No. Nope. Okay. Well, you guys have a really nice, good Labor Day. Work on your study guides and your homework. And uh, email me over the weekend if you have any questions. I'm going to be around. And uh, I'll finish this lecture for you in here in a little bit and post it for you, okay? Awesome. Thank you. All right. You guys have a great time. Thanks, thanks everybody, for participating. I appreciate it. Good Bye. Weekend. Have a great one, Steve. Thank you. Bye. Have a good weekend. Thanks.